All right, Mr. Fields, I, what I wanted you to start by telling me about was when you knew you were going to Washington and you took that train trip from Boston. Uh, no, not train, yeah, the bus trip, bus right? trip, yeah. What did you see? What was it like <coughs> in America? In <coughs> <coughs> well, of course, I was invited to the White House. Uh, my invitation to the White House to begin with and in 1901, I was invited, a public in invitation, uh, open house on January the 1st, and I was about nine months old, and I met President McKinley. Uh -huh. My next invitation was in, 19, uh, in October the 19th, in 1931, when Thomas Edison died. And after his death, he being a great friend to Dr. Stratton, and Dr. Stratton being a great friend to President Hoover, uh, they knew their interest in me, and I received a telephone call, an invitation to the White House. Well, of course, uh, I had no other uh, uh, invitation to, for a job, and I decided, well, an invitation to one at the White House? Sure, I'll take it up. So within three days, I was on my way to Washington. And of course, to travel with the least of expense, I took a bus. And uh, all through Massachusetts, uh, uh, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New Jersey, Delaware, and Maryland, into Washington, everywhere I saw churches or streams of men in line to get a bowl of soup. And uh, at then it puzzled me, as it does to this day, I never saw a woman or a child in line. And I thought to myself then, what are they doing? How are they faring? Well, I first uh, met a condition that I had long forgotten about, being in, in Massachusetts, and that was segregation. The bus stopped at a rest station, and uh, I got out with all the others, went into the restaurant, as others did, and went to the restroom. Well. Uh, after I was in there, when I went in, there were two sailors, and these sailors looked at me with a, 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 an eye that I had known years ago. Uh, what are you doing in here? But they didn't say anything. And when I returned out to the lobby of the restaurant, there's a colored gentleman there, and he says, uh, what did they say to you? I says, no one said anything to me. He says, well, uh, you're not supposed to go in here. And he took me outside and showed me these little sheds of colored women and colored men. And on my way, that was my first. On my way to Washington, when I arrived in Washington, I was told to meet Lieutenant Butler at the east entrance of the White House across from the Treasury Department. And I met him there at 10 o'clock, as I'm supposed to do. And he took me up through the corridors and round through the corridors and up the winding stairs into the butler's pantry. But when I entered the butler's pantry, there were five or six butlers, and they were all around a big table with piles of silver. And I said, goodness, I've never seen so much silver. They must have had a big party last night. And uh, as, as I was introduced, the Senate butler said to them, he says, uh, this is Fields. He's from Boston. He's well-trained and you can take him into the dining room at any time. He says, where is Ellis? Ellis was the chief butler at that time. So uh, they said, Ellis is all, but his assistant's in the dining room. And he took me into the dining room and introduced me to Encarnacion uh, uh, and uh, said, well, you can take him in any time, same story. Mm -hmm. Well, when we entered back, Encarnacion said to the group. He says, this is uh, Mr. Fields. He's from Boston. He's going to be working with us. And I could discern that uh, I wasn't really wanted. I was kind of a shock to them. So uh, one gentleman said, well, uh, you know, Mrs. Hoover doesn't like big men. And uh, I thought, well, I know the game. This is the White House where they didn't expect yeah. it here. She doesn't like big men. And it's too bad she's out for lunch because if she wasn't out for lunch, you could take him in there to day for lunch and he'd be on his way back to Boston tonight on the Federal Express. But now you did get the job. Oh, yes, okay. I got the job. Uh, now, what did you know about President Hoover? What would you think about President Hoover before you started working there? What kind of president did you think he was? What did you know about him? What kind well, of reputation did he 
Well, he had a, uh, uh, President Hoover uh, had developed a re reputation during World War I uh, in feeding all of Europe. And then he helped to Hooverize and, and organize uh, to prevent starvation and, uh, and to promote uh, uh, in, in uh, America. And uh, he had a reputation. People thought when President Hoover was elected that this was going to be the, the salvation of the world. The man was a great humanitarian, and uh, he was a great organizer. And uh, of course, he had made his wealth uh, by organizing uh, all over the world. Now, there's a funny story about FDR and, and Hoover that, that you told me before, about FDR thinking that Hoover should be president. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, FDR was so uh, excited over, over Hoover. Uh, he, I, I heard him say that the man had, uh, had a, expansion of ability in organizing. Uh, he, he could just put his hands, and, and in a second, he could bring thousands of people together and, and get production. And uh, so uh, FDR went over the country, in the eastern part of the country, because you, you sell, the Democrats were eastern and southern. And he uh, formed a group. And he tried to f persuade uh, uh, Hoover to run as president, and he is Hoover's vice president. And, but President Hoover, to uh, at that time, said he, he didn't know enough about politics, and he wouldn't dare to enter it. And, but uh, he did run. Uh, FDR ran with uh, Governor Cox of Ohio. And of course, they were defeated by the Harlan and Coolidge uh, 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 team on the Republican ticket. Now, I'm really interested about something you were talking about when you first got to Washington, really finding out it was a segregated city. Yeah. What, what, kinds of, what, what were the things that really struck you as, you as you first came to live in Washington? Well, the first thing that struck me is right in the White House. Uh, when lunchtime came, uh, I, I had a gentleman who was going to take me, show me the White House, and uh, the, uh, the acting chief at that time says, well, uh, take Fields to the dining room. And as we went down to the dining room stairs to the dining room floor, there was a room straight ahead, and uh, there's a room to the right. And we started, and he says, uh, we, we go over here. He says, uh, that's the White House dining room. And I says, oh, I thought to myself, the White House? If we are going to have a beginning, it should start right here in the White House, I was thinking to myself. And so that was the first, uh, right in the White House, that was the first uh, sign that I was in a different part of, of, of the country. What about out in public places? Well, in public. Well, in public places, uh, you, you, there were no signs up. There were no signs, uh, black only, but the people of color knew their limitations, what areas they could go in. You, uh, there was only one, there was one uh, uh, department store that uh, blacks weren't welcome at all, and that was in the great Garfinkel, and now they're out of business. But at that time, <laughs> the blacks couldn't, uh, weren't welcome there. They, you'd stand around before you'd be served, uh, and you could, you'd no, no question, you would never get an account there. Uh, and uh, the theaters, well, the theaters in, in downtown, well, there were not any movies you could go to. And uh, there was one uh, stage show you go to, and that was the, uh, the burlesque show, but you had to go up to the top floor, <laughs> up in the gallery. And, uh, uh, but they were in, say, uh, Central Park and 7th and and, and streets, and then and on 13th and 14th Street and U Street, there were black theaters that you, you went to. No one never, never approached going downtown. Now, if a show would come to uh, Washington that had a black cast, there would be certain days set aside for the colored people to go. We didn't say black in those days, we said colored folks. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. It's a time that people, have, a lot of people don't even know about. Yes, yes. Let me ask you something else about 1931. How were people that, that just, I mean, how did people survive? As they, what, what happened to them when they lost their work? I mean, well, uh, they, they did the best they could. I mean, usually most people in those days, uh, let me uh, uh, kind of inject something here. 
And in the in the uh, even in the states where there were factories and things like that, uh, there was always a shutdown. Say almost uh, say around after Thanksgiving, they would over uh, over to do produce. The people would work overtime, and that used to puzzle me as a kid. I'd say, well, they work overtime, they make all this money overtime, and then they they would shut down. They never had any money to cover to plan for that. And uh, that puzzled me as a kid. I used to say, well, they're making all this money, uh, why don't they save something? And in two weeks' time, people would, would, they would be uh, dependent. And the only thing was private charity. Uh, and uh, the Salvation Army was one of the outstanding. Uh, yeah. Okay, you know what? You're doing just, I, I hardly have to ask you questions. We just ran out of film. It's a real quick moment. You know <laughs> really? And speed. Okay, so just tell me about how people, what, what kind of, how, well, how people got help when they lost their jobs. What, what happened to them? They, they, they just wandered, uh, wandered around in, in a sense because it was only private charity. Uh, certain city officials, I know in Indianapolis, Indiana, they had a mayor that had the name of uh, Lou Shanks. And Lou Shanks, ever so often, he would bring in a, a carload of potatoes. And uh, uh, the people would all go down and get bags of potatoes. Uh, you'd go out and uh, if you worked, you'd perhaps get uh, so many pounds of beans, or cornmeal, a flour, and uh, uh, you'd, no eggs. You, uh, you'd have to scramble around and get those yourself. And uh, there was a packing house that used to sell the rinds, uh, the skins uh, of trimmings and the trimmings of beef and so forth on. You could get that for about five cents or 10 cents a pound. And uh, I, I know my family did, and, and liver. Uh, liver and, and, and lights and those things, uh, they would sell and they could get them cheaply. So but people sometimes would work and they wouldn't even get paid. Oh, yes, so they'd, they'd be paid in, 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 in food supplies, mm -hmm. cornmeal. And and, and usually uh, starches, cornmeal, uh, well, you'd get beans and things like that. And, of course, that was more or less the common diet. And uh, your meat would be these skins or what the rinds are, or the trimmings off of the butcher shop at the big packing houses, things like that. Now, I want to change the subject a little bit. You got this job at the White House, mm -hmm. and Hoover, at President Hoover, then wanted you to serve breakfast every morning. Could mm -hmm. you just describe that scene? Well, how did the day start? What, what, what were you doing? I want to hear about the medicine ball and all of that. Yes, yes. Well, I, I'd been there three days. Uh, I'd arrived on Thursday, and on uh, Friday night, I was told that uh, the president had requested my servant, detail, serving his uh, cabinet breakfast, medicine ball breakfast table. Well, uh, I didn't believe it because I had heard the argument, be argument between two brothers that it's not my time and so forth on. And uh, so I said, well, th this is my lot. And uh, I had to be there at six, uh, six o'clock in the morning. And you would uh, sit up on the, uh, uh, outside, uh, uh, unless it was raining or snowing, Andrew Jackson Magnolia tree. Andrew Jackson planted that tree in 1829, and in memory of Rachel, his wife. And there's many old stories about that old tree. Uh, to uh, personally the wood under that old tree, and, and President Taft had an accident on that old tree. Taft was a uh, president. He was a heavy eater, and, and he liked the champagne, and he wouldn't drink a, a, a champagne glass. He'd have a goblet of champagne, and then he would go sleep at the table. <laughs> well, on Sundays out there, under this old tree in the summertime, you didn't have air conditioning then, and they would have dinner, uh, some Sunday meal, midday meal under the old tree. And uh, Taft would have his heavy meal, and then he would go sleep. Uh -huh. And uh, Butler had to stand by with him. Well, uh, he was a huffer and a puffer, and he would blow. And as he, he did, a little bird got disturbed at this huffing and blowing, uh, blowing underneath him. He bombed away, and with keen precision, he hit President Taft's mustache. As you know, he had a flowing oh, mustache. Oh, no. Yes. The bird was right in his mustache? Yes. 
<laughs> and uh, the President Taft was sworn, mm -hmm. and his man, Jackson, told me the story that was with him. And his man went over to him and took the finger bowl and the best he could, cleared up his mustache. <laughs> And as he said to Jackson, he said, Jackson, you ever tell this? I'll have your head on the platter. Oh, my uh, goodness. And so this tree had that oh, reputation. Yes. Lincoln would be, put a shawl around, and in those days, you could look down to see the Potomac River, and you could see the, uh, the, uh, the southern, uh, the rebels on, mm. nearby on the other side of the river. So he watched the war. Oh, yes. Well, I wonder who. Yeah, well, Hoover was, oh, uh, uh, Lincoln was his, his, his idol. Uh -huh. yeah, he, he would write his speeches and things and so forth in, in Lincoln's bedroom. He, he wrote wanted all his, to sort of be he his wanted, in, of his yeah, tradition. and uh, uh, today Lincoln's the only spirit that really roams around the White House. So? Yeah, yeah. yeah, and uh, so uh, the, 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 I was told that uh, the president wanted me. Okay, now I just need to, let me, can, do you need to start up again? Because uh, I want to hear about the breakfast yes, and, yes, and how yes. um, yeah. I told you we found some footage of uh, some the, uh, movies of the people actually playing. Yes, yes, Madison Balls. yes. Tell me how they did that. What? Yeah. Okay. Well, the that morning uh, I got my information, and uh, uh, so I went out. Uh, I was told to count. You don't know how many is coming. And the cabinet might bring others. And so I did, and I'd counted, and I had set up the tree. And it was closed in October, about the 25th of October. And the old magnolia trees are these beautiful uh, 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 leaves that are, they look like they're gloss, and they have a, a rust on them, and they look like they might have hair underneath them. And that morning, the frost had been on the, the little uh, October. Uh, late frost on them, and the sun come out, and they're uh, weeping. And uh, as I sit up the table, uh, one drop hit my neck, back of my neck, and I almost jumped out of my skin. And I would thank God for it, because if I'd been pouring a cup of coffee, what would have happened? And so as, uh, uh, as I uh, uh, finished and I counted the, the number of people, and I had set up for 11. Well, this, uh, they had been playing for about, uh, I guess, 35 or, uh, 25 or 30 minutes. And they would uh, part, uh, uh, they had an eight-ounce ball. Yeah, there's all sizes of the medicine balls, but they had an eight-ounce ball that they throw so over. Who, play, who played the medicine ball? The cabinet officers, the oh. president, all of them, uh, except uh, 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 Secretary of Navy Adams and Secretary uh, of uh, of uh, uh, Treasurer Mellon, and Secretary of State Stimson. And I assumed that they were gentlemen in the age that they wouldn't participate in that. Well, they would be out there and they'd toss this ball around, and then they'd come to have breakfast. Well, just about time as I thought they'd be coming in, the uh, uh, doorman walked in with the gentleman, and, uh, he, uh, and uh, he says, they're out there playing. And he, the gentleman looked out and said, oh, yes, he went on out. And then he told me, he says, uh, 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 that's Jesse Jones. He's the head of reconstruction finance. He's going to be your guest here this morning. And I says, well, let him make 12. He says, uh, didn't they tell you about uh, Mark Sullivan? I says, who's Mark Sullivan? He says, he's a newspaper writer. He's here every morning and he'll become late. So you better sit up for another. And I says, well, that'll be 13. I thought to myself, that's unlucky. And then he turned to me and he says, uh, if you need any more blankets, they're in, they're in the China room. Well, no one had told me the blankets in the China room or anything, see. So uh, I considered they were trapping me, see. But I just laughed it off. And so he got, I went and got the blankets, and he put a blanket in each chair. And after they played medicine ball, they'd come in to have this breakfast, which would be uh, 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 grapefruit juice and, and fruit and coffee and a whole, whole wheat toast. And... Uh, uh, then you were supposed to wrap them up in, in these blankets. Well, of course, the president walked in. Now, I had met him that night before. He knew, he knew me, but he walked right in just like he did, didn't. didn't I, I, I couldn't discern that he saw me. And he sat down, and I wrapped him up 
<laughs> and his blanket, he didn't even look up at me. <laughs> and, uh, and he started his conversation. He says, gentlemen, you all know Jesse Jones. He has some information for us. And then they went into the detail so of the condition. So what really happened every morning? Who, who, how, how did the morning go? What, what happened at the breakfast table? Uh, yeah, yeah, he, 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 he would usually go over to each cabinet officer uh, and, and ask him the activities and the prosp uh, what their, their perspectives was and what had gone on and so forth on. He went around the whole cabinet table to each cabinet officer, uh, secretary of interior, uh, commerce, the, uh, the attorney general, uh, treasurer. Did, did Hoover do a lot of talking? Did he, was he lecturing them, telling them what no, to do? He, no, he, he, was, he was asking for information. And then he would lecture. If he would get all things, then he would lecture. But what, what kinds of questions, what kinds of things did they talk about? Did they talk about the Depression? Did oh, they, they talk talked about, about the Depression. Oh, that was up, utmost. That's all they talked about, the Depression, except uh, when the injection of the time of the Massey case in, uh, in Pearl Harbor, when the, the is five, uh, and also uh, uh, Lindbergh's uh, uh, kidnapping, child kidnapping. They would all of these open with a few words of what was going on in that, and then they'd go right into to the business of, of the of the. Uh, now, uh, one the of the thing. things I imagine they must have really um, spent some time discussing was this bonus army, because the bonus army oh, came yes. into Washington. Yes, yes. So, what kinds of what, what kinds of things when the, when the bonus marchers started arriving, what kinds of things did they say at the at the breakfast table the next day? Well, uh, at the breakfast table, of course, th that would take up the Secretary of War Hurley. Uh, and the Attorney General, and they would have little get-togethers over that. You, you, you know, I, I uh, can understand, I, really, I, I learned uh, what uh, our, our three branches of government, what, what it really means to us, and in, 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 in little do we perhaps know about it, our, our own freedom, and how jealously they, 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 they do, they jealously fight to protect their authorities. And this gives a control and so protect. Like what kinds of things like Congress and the oh, Congress? What kinds of things would they say? Well, the 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 rights of the of the Congress to and the rights of the uh, the Attorney General uh, and and uh, uh, how uh, and, and it's really uh, the President, the Executive Branch, uh, as uh, Mr. Barclay used to say, Senator Barclay where he came up from the ranks, from the Congress up to the executive branch, because he was the vice president. He said when he was a congressman, uh, he thought that the executive branch and the Senate were a bunch of overbearing so-and-sos. And he said they were trying to run the country. When he got to be a senator, then he reflected that these people down here, they, they were a bunch of nitwits they, they were trying to overdo. He says, now as I'm in the executive branch, I, he says, in a sense, says, well, the hell with both of them. They both, they, 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 they don't, we don't need them. The executive branch should be running the area. So, uh, did Hoover have a lot of complaints about Congress during this time? Oh, oh yes. What did Hoover he, say about Congress? Well, his, his complaint was trying to... Try, could you just explain that you're talking about President Hoover? I'm President, Pre President Hoover. Uh, he, uh, he, he made a suggestion one morning uh, that... Uh, he thought, uh, this is uh, before the election, that uh, he thought he saw a, 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 a bright uh, uh, gray brightening the dark clouds of the depression. That's the way he put it, gray brightening the dark clouds of depression. And he says, I see a new form of government. And he says, it, it means that uh, the masses of people should never suffer again from that, that uh, should be said. Perhaps we should go to the to the Bible when Joseph went in and interpreted Pharaoh's dream and people from all around. Now, in times of uh, plenty, we should ensure should not grant it, but we should ensure the uh, uh, people so in the masses would have protection. And, and he said, "This cannot. You cannot depend on." on the, the politician, you can't depend on the uh, manufacturer, uh, it's going to take statesmen. Okay, now let's, let you just think of saying that, and let's switch. We just need to, just that very last piece. So now I'm 
real, I want to talk about that breakfast meeting when the bonus marchers started coming to Washington. Mm -hmm. what, what happened? That would have been in, in May of 1932. Yeah, 1932. And, well, the Congress was, uh, uh, they, were, they were trying to get a, a bonus, I think, of $10,000. I think that's what they were trying to do. And uh, 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 Congress was in session. And uh, there was a group that formed, American Legion, so forth on. And uh, when they started coming in, the president uh, suggested uh, he and Brigadier General, retired Brigadier General uh, Glassford, he uh, was the chief of police. And uh, uh, the president had suggested that why not send army cooks, uh, army uh, uh, kitchens over, and feed them. Well, the cabinet, and especially the, the Hurley of the War Department, said that was only encourage more to come, and that it was a ragged army, uh, I forget how he described them, were laying siege to Washington. And he says, uh, you, you've got to drive them out. Uh, uh, that'd be accommodating them, and we would just get more and more and more and more. And of course, that went around the table. So they really debated that. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It went around the table. Now, as I say, the, the president has suggested uh, that uh, they s send <laughs> army kitchens over and feed the men, see? And, but, uh, you see, uh, uh, President uh, Hoover, uh, I, I suppose, if he'd been Harry Truman, he'd have said, you get so-and-so over there, see? But he, his, 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 uh, his uh, advisors, and, and they were all, none of them were, uh, were, were in favor of sending army kitchens over there to feed the men because it would only enhance a, a larger group of loafers and so forth on. Now, did you do. hear them talk about the conditions in the camp, or did you go down and see the camps yourself? No, I, no, I no, never went down. No, I didn't see them. No, I didn't see them. Uh, uh, didn't see him at all. Now, when the when the people in the cabinet, Hurley and some of the people who didn't want the bonus marchers to be encouraged, what kinds of things were they afraid of? What did they say? Were they what, were they scared well, of these men? Well, they, 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 yeah, and, and to this sense, it was a disgrace for them to be ragged bunch of of, of, of uh, people, and they tried to claim some of them were communists and some of them were counterfeiters and I don't know what all. And uh, and uh, the uh, the 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 uh, president merely listened, and uh, no one <laughs> no one was was in in favor of really doing anything for them only to get them out and herd them up, and of course the the bill it, it's many thought the bill would be passed, but it wasn't passed, and then when Congress went home in June, well that's when the and, of course, I remember the, that incident quite well because uh, uh, the president always uh, took a nap after lunch. And uh, he'd have lunch around 1 o'clock, and then he'd nap, uh, say, from one uh, from 1.45 to around about 2.30. And uh, he had, it was at his nap. And uh, General MacArthur came in uh, at I was taking him away him from his nap and said that they were, they were just getting unbearable. And the president says, well, why not, as I understand it, and I didn't hear this, this as I understand. The president says, well, why not take a troop of cavalry over there and see what you can do? Well, now, at that time, they had just taken in, I say, about six or eight tanks. They were, tanks were new and they the Italians had used them uh, with Halle Celeste, but the little things they had were notorious. And he uh, and they had developed some tanks. And uh, uh, the the order was given. And I see, I see, because uh, I was in the dining room when General MacArthur came down. And of course, he had he was very fond of his uniforms, and he was a good-looking, stately man. He was a military man, more Napoleonic, like you know, and. Uh, he strutted out, and in no time, uh, we saw a commotion. And uh, these tanks were coming across from, from Fort Myers in Virginia, rolling up Pennsylvania Avenue, going 
going to across the Acosta River. Across now, the I river. know that they, they, you know, they routed the Bonus Army and, and they actually burned up some of their camps. Oh, did yes. You see any of that? What did that look like? Well, uh, uh, I saw it at night. Uh, you could get on Pennsylvania Avenue and I'd look down and you could see the whole uh, scene was, uh, was ablaze. Yes, the whole scene was ablaze. And the gentleman, uh, the officer in charge of that group was uh, Lieutenant I, I, uh, Eisenhower. Right, Eisenhower. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Now, the next morning, at that breakfast The next meeting, morning... What was the discussion after this, after this destruction of the camps? The next Who morning... said what? Uh, the, president, uh, the president himself said, he said, uh, 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 the American people will never believe this. Why did we have to use so much force for these unarmed men? Uh, unarmed men? He says, I've never believed that uh, we, we did this. He says, that we, there's no way. He says, and I know the Democrats, because it, it was in the, the Democrats' the convention was coming up was, oh, in June, see, and he says, uh, they'll never be able uh, uh, to understand uh, such action. And, uh, and, of course, in the meantime, uh, this, uh, this uh, trooper from... Uh, from Chicago was killed in the in the upheaval in the and uh, uh, and and the same same troops that uh, that uh, caused of his death. They next uh, next two or three days were buried him in Arlington, and they were his uh, his funeral escort. Now, did Hoover feel that MacArthur had exceeded his his orders? No, he if he did, he didn't say so. He no, he never no, he never said so. And of course, uh, uh, of course, uh, as it was troops, the the uh, tanks were they had no rank then, they had no unit, and they were uh, considered cavalry. So. Uh, Okay, so now the next morning at the breakfast, what happened? The next morning at the breakfast. Okay? I'm sorry. Okay. Good start. I'm sorry. We just had a little noise there, and that's mm -hmm. our fault. You, the mm -hmm. next morning. The next morning at the breakfast table, the president was very much upset, and he said uh, uh, to the cabinet, he says, uh, I, I, I know there's no way we can explain to the American people what happened yesterday? Why did we have to use so much force against unarmed veterans? He says, why did we have to do that? He says, I know the, the Democrats are laughing themselves to death. He says, we cannot, no way we cannot, can explain it. No way we can't. And that, that was the end of the conversation. He said, no more about it. They all there, the, the cabinet office, and, all, and they all sit there with, with their heads down and listening, that's all. So... He knew that was a big Oh, yes. Problem. Oh, he knew. Yeah, he knew. Yeah, yeah. What kind of political reputation did, did Hoover end up with? Do you think he was maligned? Do you, what? Well, he was maligned in... in, in, in did you in, say President Hoover? Or President Hoover. Yes, okay. Uh, to me, it was maligned because uh, it, it was a great father for the, the Democrats. And, of course, uh, the man had a great reputation. Uh, at times, we, they thought of him as being... Uh, the paramount of American organization and the Democrats, they, they still now and then you hear them go back to the Hoover days. Even now they've mentioned the Hoover as if it was the blame of Hoover. And it, it, it took him, uh, you, you know, young people today, they used to mention Hoover. Oh, he, who was he? And they think he was a rich man in the beginning. He was born an orphan. I mean, he was an orphan when he was eight years old. And the difficulty he had it's getting really educated. Uh, oh yes, yeah. getting the education. Yeah. Now I want to um, ask you about this other famous depression president that you you got to know, FDR. Yeah. And I wonder if you could um, start telling me about when FDR came to the White House that first time. I guess yeah. it was the first time you met. Him. Yes, yes. And you said Hoover was kind of curious about sort of. Yes, yes, FDR. yes, yes, yes. What was Hoover saying about FDR? Well, uh, you know, President Hoover. Never had much to say about anyone, and uh, maybe that was part of his his fault. Uh, he, uh, I think, President Hoover gave you the impression that uh, 
you, uh, you, you talk, and, and uh, I'll take care of the matter. And, and uh, I, I, uh, the difference in he and Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, President Roosevelt would talk to anyone, and, and he'd leave you feeling that you would give him good advice. Um, but you, you didn't have that inclination to talk to President uh, Hoover because that, that, that was a distance. Yeah. FDR had had polio. Yes, he'd had was, polio. Was, uh, did Hoover talk about that? The, the cabinet brought it up. Uh, the governors were holding a convention uh, in uh, Hot Springs, Virginia. And, uh, okay, now just, we just ran out of film one again, uh -huh. but we're doing just great. Uh -huh. Okay, so there was this governor's conference the going governor's, in Virginia. What was Hoover going to do? Uh, the governor's conference was going in Hot Springs, and uh, the, con the uh, conversation was about that governor's con uh, conference. L. Smith had said he was going to run, and so this conference they were trying to get together, and there was uh, Garner, and Governor White of Ohio, McNutt of Indiana, uh, Hamilton uh, Lewis of uh, uh, Illinois, uh, and, uh, uh, and FDR. And uh, the conference seemed to be leaning towards FDR. And at the breakfast table, the uh, question came up uh, about ha uh, his handicap. Uh, there was always Dr. Boone with the cabinet every morning. And uh, they asked Dr. Boone, what do you know about it? I don't, he says, I don't know anything, but I haven't heard anything particularly about him. But he says, uh, I'll try to find out. No, I know we have uh, heard anything. So the conversation went on about him. So finally, President uh, Hoover says, well, uh, when is the conference over? And someone said, well, on a Thursday. The conference will end on Thursday. He says, well, so as not to interfere with the conference, why not invite him? They tell him that the President of the United States wants to talk to him about the, the conditions of the world, financial conditions of the country, and invite them for a stag. We don't want their women folks because we want to size up this potential champ of the Democratic Party, FDR. So now what job did you have? Well, the, uh, within three days, the governors accepted, of course, it was like a command to you, the president, so they accepted, and the, the dinner was set for Friday night. And uh, the president's office received uh, information from the governor of New York saying that the governor would like to come in through the south grounds of the White House so uh, he could uh, take the elevator up to the dining room floor as he couldn't negotiate stairs without a ramp. And also that he'd like to have a strong, sturdy cheer at the table and that there'd be a strong man to hold that cheer. Well, of course, the governor got his his all the information he wanted, and about uh, 15 or 20 minutes of uh, dinner, the governor's ballot was permitted in, uh, call him the name of, uh, of uh, well... McDuffie, I think. McDuffie, yeah. yeah. McDuffie. And McDuffie came in, and, uh, and he went to the table, showed me how to place the chair within 45 degrees on the table. And he said to me, he says, now, uh, he will alert you when he's going to take a seat. But don't help him even if you think he's fallen. He'll let you know if he wants help. So you just stand by that chair. Then we went down to the oval room downstairs, diplomatic room, and there we met the governor. And uh, he drove up in the car, and Mac went up to him. He says, Governor, this is Fields. He's on the White House staff. He's going to help me with you tonight. And this man beamed. Oh, I had a beam. And he said, well, hello, Fields. And he took my hand in both hands and, and shaking my hand and looking right at me with a smile. And then he put his arm around my shoulder and the arm around his valet shoulder. And we lifted him out of the car and placed him in the wheelchair. Well, I had assumed that I would lead him to the elevator. And as I started off to lead him, the governor says, uh, wait a minute, Fields, come here, walk by me here. I want to talk with you. Well, I walked by the governor, and all the way up, we, we uh, talked. 
and he was asking me about myself and so forth on, where I was from and so forth. And he also asked me, did I know Mary Curley? And I laughed. I said, yes, I think I voted for Mary Curley a couple of times. And he laughed about it. And uh, uh, all up to the, to the elevator door. And at the door, uh, at the lobby of the elevator, there was a fellow named Charlie Green who had known him when he was assistant secretary of the Navy. And he looked up and he said, well, hello, Charles. How are you, Charles? And, and with that uh, swagger of his and warm greetings, and this, and Charles and he shook hands. And then when he got to the elevator, there was John Mays. And then he did bowl over. John, you look the same. John, have you, what have you, when's the last time you had a tip from Barney Baruch? Uh, Char, uh, Mays was a horse player. He liked to gamble on the horses. And, and uh, Mr. Baruch used to give him uh, tips. And of course, if the horse lost, well, Mr. Baruch would kind of repay him for his tips. And the president went all through it. He says, and, and you know, he turned to me, he says, Mays never lost less than $5. It was always $5. Amazing. Yeah. So he really knew everybody. Oh, yes. You know, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So did he make a real impression at this meeting, at this meeting with, with the president and all the other governors? Well, with the other governors, there wasn't much conversation. But when he got up to the elevator uh, uh, corridor, uh, we let him out the elevator. Uh, then I discovered that he had on heavy steel braces. And as we, he locked these braces and his legs were prone from that sitting position. And then he put his arms around our shoulders and we stood him on his feet. And he took the arm of his bodyguard and a cane in one hand and walked into the dining room up to the angle of that chair. And uh, with a nod to me, uh, he fell. He literally fell in the chair because when he sat down, his legs were prone from that sitting position. And then uh, I waited until he unlocked each leg and as he lifted to move to the table, I gradually moved the chair to the table. Now, it did take a strong chair and, and no slight man could hold because he had developed, he had a magnificent torso. And he, with just his torso, he weighed 180 pounds alone. His legs were withered. And he it, really coped though. He didn't, he, oh, wasn't, he wasn't held back by it. Oh no, he was determined. He was determined, uh, and uh, he was he was jovial. Uh, uh, most people uh, they they end up in kind of be kind of kind of scratchy, you know. But he was jovial, jovial. Now what what the next day at the breakfast table was the, there? What what tell me? The next day at the breakfast table, of course, that evening, the crew in the pantry. I had about twenty people, uh, waiters uh, serving the, the dinner. And uh, as they came out, after seeing him seated, they said, oh my God, that man can never be president. What makes him think he can be president? You gotta be active. How are you gonna be president? He can't be president. Well, the next morning at the, at the cabinet meeting, they were thinking much like the, <laughs> the butlers in the pantry. How can he be president? And Dr. Boone said, well, it's impossible. Uh, the people uh, uh, to elect him president, and they find out he's only a half man, they'll never elect him as president. But there was one man at the table that spoke up, and that was Justice Stone, who later became Chief Justice Stone. Justice Stone says, well, let's not uh, be in a hurry. Let's don't uh, rush this thing, because we say mu much about it, it will uh, kick back on us. Now, what did he mean by that? Tell me well, he meant, he meant that if they whispered about the ha him, him being handicapped, uh, that uh, it, they, the people would, would uh, begin to think that they were, they, they were telling one of those uh, unpleasant things about a candidate just to defeat him. And that with his appearance, and he went on to tell them about his appearance, he says, uh, there are few people who will never see him stand, standing up like he did with us. He says, he'll come in walking on someone's arm. And he says, and of course, he won't, he, you might be startled to see him walking on someone's arm, but the man's standing, he has this magnificent torso. And he says, and he'll be standing at the podium, and says, he can stand there for hours. And he says he has a magnificent, warm smile and a voice that radiates with sincerity. And says, well, I knew media of communication, which is then just the radio. 
And he says, well, that new media of communication, he can be mighty impressive. And he will refute anything you might say about him. And what about President Hoover? President Hoover never said a word. Just never said one word. I listened and looked around the table, never said one word. No. Well, what kind of reputation do you remember FDR was developing during the campaign? He made this speech about a forgotten man. Do you remember oh, yes. that? Did that cause a sensation? Well, uh, it, uh, uh, he and Al Smith got into the, got in to, to, to the primary, and uh, Al Smith accused him of bringing class against class and, and so forth on. And uh, he spoke then at, the, at his speech. He, he went to, uh, to the convention. He, went, he took the convention, went to the convention in a plane. Well, could you just start that again? Because that's interesting. Could yeah. you say FDR or... FDR. FDR went to, to accept uh, at the convention in a plane, which was unthought of in those days. And it was kind of a tricky trip, but the, uh, the cabinet felt that he was playing up to the gallery. Uh, he's like his Uncle Ted. Uncle Ted would play up to the gallery. And if he's like his Uncle Ted, he'll play up to the gallery. And of course, people say, well, if a man can't be a cripple and get in a plane when no one else is hardly daring to ride in a plane. And he, and he went to and accepted, uh, accept, uh, gave his acceptance speech. And that's when he talked about the forgotten man. And uh, at that same breakfast that morning, talking about that, the, uh, they were talking about it. And the president said, uh, well, in 20 years from now, he says, uh, this is the thing that's coming. Okay. We just need to switch. This will probably be our, you know, just almost getting to be our last role. But, and then... You, you were telling me something about how they talked about the convention. Uh, after the... Okay, and if you could just remember to say Hoover and FDR, yeah. so that'll help us. No problem. Uh, well, <laughs> the next morning, uh, of course, the, the nomination, uh, he, President... Uh, FDR, well, he wasn't president, he was governor. Governor uh, Roosevelt went to the convention to give his uh, acceptance speech, and he went there by plane. And uh, the cabinet was, uh, were really, uh, especially Mark Sullivan, he, he, he said, well, he's like his un Uncle Ted. He's playing to the gallery. He says, uh, the people in the gallery, they'll see all of this, and, and it's exciting. Uh, but he says, nobody's going to pay any attention to that. That won't get the votes. And uh, he uh, went to the convention, and there he talked about the forgotten man. And uh, uh, of course, from then on, the, as, the, as the campaign went on, uh, the, uh, hit the, the radio was really outstanding. And then he would make the, he'd go all over the country. And uh, they had a picture one morning showing him at Indianapolis, on the circle in Indianapolis, in the old English uh, uh, restaurant or hotel, standing on the balcony. And it all was a glorious, uh, outstanding picture. All the monument was packed with people. And FBR standing up with his elegant and uh, poles and talking to the people. And that picture seemed to upset the, the cabinet. Uh, it was so impressive to them. And they passed it around, passed it around, and looked around, so forth on. They, uh, they were then interested uh, about uh, uh, Coolidge. They wanted Coolidge to say something. And mm -hmm. Coolidge had refused to participate. He hadn't said anything at all. And of course, the story is that President Coolidge was much upset when, when Hoover uh, accepted. Uh, uh, he said that, I do not choose to run. And of course, no sooner he said that, uh, Hoover, like a fish hawk, he jumped to the bait and started running for the president. And so, uh, he didn't have too much love for right. President Hoover. Now, during the, during the campaign, did the, did the talk at the breakfast table, did Hoover seem to think he was going to win the election? Or did he think he was, uh, F he was in trouble with FDR? Do you know? Well, he, he felt he was in trouble. He felt he was in trouble. His, his whole uh, thought was that these people would not believe the political muck. He called it political muck. They're not, they won't believe the political muck. 
They know my reputation. He, he, he just didn't feel that he should rebuttal. Uh, he was going to proceed with his, his, his own uh, upright attitude that the people will not believe the political muck, that I have no interest in the masses of the people when uh, I've spent more of my life in the masses of people. Uh, and they will, not, they will not believe that political muck. Do you think right into November, Hoover, Hoover thought he had a chance to win? Well, uh, I'm sure he did. And of course, they were dependent on Literary Digest. And Literary Digest uh, showed him winning all, <laughs> all along. And of course, I don't think Literary Digest has ever taken a poll since. <laughs> that was since 60 years ago. Yeah. So the conversation, the cabinet members, even in October and November, what, what kinds of things were they saying about the campaign? Well, they, they felt that, uh, that the, the crowds were not votes. That's what they said, the crowds are not votes. And he was getting crowds all over the country, but the crowds are not votes. And uh, uh, their, their whole thought was the crowds are not votes at all. That uh, especially in the, in, in the North, uh, they, 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 didn't, they, they just couldn't see it because this man had a silver tone, and they called him almost like a Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday was a great evangelist in that day. And, uh, but uh, towards the end, they began to say to, them, to themselves, uh, he's sounding like a, mm, what's the, well, oh, I can't think oh, of it. Oh, no matter. Okay, yeah. I want to just cut for a second. This has been how it is that Walter White came to the White House and what he did when he, when he got there. Well, uh, Mrs. Roosevelt, uh, she, she was quite active back then, and she was telling Franklin he'd have to pass, he'd have to do, do something about it, you know. And uh, uh, this uh, 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 night, she was talking to him about it. And she was telling... Mrs. Roosevelt. Yeah, but you also... It, the anti-lynch law, is that what you're uh, talking about? Uh, okay. Uh, this uh, maybe uh, you could just start again. The anti-lynch law. Uh, she was talking to the president about it, and she was talking to him also about what uh, uh, Wilkie had said about it. And uh, so the uh, presi uh, president said, uh, well, he says, uh, I know what I'll do. He says, I'll get Walter White. He looked up, and he says, today is Wednesday. Uh, I'll have Walter White. Uh, I have early called Walter White and have him here for Sunday tea, and I'll talk to him about it. And uh, uh, Mrs. Roosevelt kind of laughed. She says, uh, you don't want uh, Early to call. And he says, why not? He says, well, Early. And, and Walter had uh, fallen out. And he says, what about, about the anti-lynching law? She says, because uh, Early thought he was too, too fresh about it, too, too outspoken about it. And, and Walter also gave him his feigning. And the president, oh, I didn't know that. And he says, well, he says, then, uh, she says, well, you better let me call Walter Franklin. And he says, all right, Babs, you call Walter. So Walter arrived for the uh, tea at 4.30. And well, Mrs. Sarah Roosevelt, we call her Delano, Mrs. Delano, she was house guest. And she liked to function in on certain things. And so to kind of give her a go little boost. The president had her to come down to pour tea out on the South Portico. And uh, they, of course, Walter was talking to the president all the time. I didn't know what the conversation was until I went out uh, when he rang the bell that he wanted to leave. So uh, I escorted Mr. White out. And then uh, I went back to hold the chair for, the, uh, for the, his ballot, put him in, see? So I went back, and, and this conversation I heard, Mrs. Ro Sarah said, uh, well, that was such a nice man, such a gentleman, she says. Uh, he was so interested in the colored people. And he says, oh, yes, M mother, you know, that's Walter White. You've met him before. I, I have, she says. Well, what, what, what about him? Well, he's the head of the National Association of, of Colored People. Oh, she said. He isn't colored. Yes, she is, he said. And uh, uh, so that was all I heard of that conversation. Now, uh, what about how President Roosevelt and Mrs. Roosevelt 
thought about the anti-lynch law. Did you ever overhear anything about that? Well, of course, the president, the president was quite a politician. The president, uh, uh, he knew uh, as much as you want to do a thing, he knew that if he went out uh, uh, pushing this thing, that uh, the country, you know, the majority of the people in the country, he'd never, he'd never get it through. He had to manipulate. He got to go through the Congress to get it. I think Johnson's the only man who could have ever done what he did because he just went to those guys and almost hit them in the mouth and tell them to do it. But with he, he, so he, uh, he, he could, uh, he could, he kept the South. And, and, and the blacks and the other minorities believing that uh, they didn't, the South didn't believe he meant what he said. And the minorities believed what he said. See? That was that kind of a new one. And, and it takes a, it, it, it isn't that it's a dishonest man, but you know the situation in which you're working. Uh, you can confront all the time and, and get success. Confront means you've got to go out there and fight. You're going to have to shoot somebody or kill somebody. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Let's just stop a minute while, while I switch over. I wanted to do. Okay. Justice Frank Rutter was was an advisor in uh, to President uh, Roosevelt, and you could depend on I when they'd have luncheon on the, the old Mike no tree, I could depend on getting some information. And it would usually be about minorities or some legal thing, see, uh, on the New Deal and so forth on. And uh, the, uh, uh, it, they, uh, it was after the, uh, it was uh, July, was near, there had been a promise of July the 1st that the president was going to uh, uh, get through some action on the uh, uh, rights to work, uh, on the on the contracts, backs couldn't they, they weren't qualified yet. Nobody was teaching them to be qualified and so forth on, and so uh, uh, Justice Frankfurter was talking to him about the Supreme Court. Uh, Hughes was resigning, as he said, the first. This was in June, the first of July, and says you better be thinking about somebody for for the job. And uh, he also suggested that he get Justice Stone because Justice Stone was a, a moderate Republican and it'd be, with the war threatening, be just a thing to do. And then he says, and while I'm talking to you about it, he says that the, uh, uh, Philip Randolph uh, uh, is planning a march. And he went on to tell him uh, uh, about the, the act lack of, of this bill. And he says, uh, uh, president says, well, my God, what are they thinking about? He says, this is something. What are we going to do? We have, if they come, you can imagine what that will do in Washington, all of these uh, colored people marching we, into Washington. We did run out, but yeah. you just, I, I just, we'll do the switch, and I just need you to go back, you know? Or? Well, they were plan the threat was uh, that he was organizing not only the, the, the paternal organization, mm -hmm. the church organizations, okay. he was planning on about 10,000. Well, let's, yeah. let's, let's hear what Frankfurter told everyone. Okay, so how did FDR learn about the March on Washington? Well, uh, at a, at a, in June of 19, 1941, uh, he was having lunch with the president, and he'd been talking about other things, but uh, uh, about the Supreme Court uh, Justice, uh, Chief Justice. And then he told the president that uh, about... Uh, uh, the organization that uh, A. Philip Randolph was getting up here. He was bringing, trying to get all, organize all the fraternity organizations and churches and so forth uh, and, and aggravate amount of nearly 10,000 10, people to march on Washington for this rights to work. And the president's, oh my God, he says, uh, what is he thinking about? Can you imagine? He says, Frank, uh, uh, he, he always called him by his name. Uh, Phillips. Phillips. Can you imagine, Phillips, what this will mean? All these people coming in, these colored people coming in to Washington. He says, that can, oh, that can upset everything. He says, we got to stick together. He says, uh, uh, then Franklin, uh, then uh, Mr. Justice Frankfurter said, well, he says, uh, uh, no doubt uh, uh, Randolph is, is more outspoken 
than uh, at this time, but he says it's no more than I would be if I was in Randolph's place. And uh, so then uh, the, uh, the uh, president uh, said, well, something has to be done. He says, well, I tell you, uh, Franklin says, why, why not talk, get Mrs. Roosevelt and, and uh, Sidney Hillman and the little flower, LaGuardia, to talk to them. So they did, but uh, the Randolph and them told uh, LaGuardia. LaGuardia says, what have I done? They, they scolded him, so they were determined to have the march. So then by the, uh, I forget now, whether it was the, by July the 1st, and now the president had issued the order to uh, OPM to, uh, to, uh, to proceed with the right to work uh, rule regulations. What, do you, what was what was Roosevelt worried about? What was what was the pressure he was feeling? Well, he was feeling the pressure not only if, but from the from the unions. He's feeling the pressure from the the groups uh, in aviation and all the the uh, groups of as he said people uh, who do not understand. And in many instances, he says in, they're not any better educated than the colored people. Uh, their rights uh, the, to, to participate in this, and we need, we're going to need everybody in this uh, program. What, um, what, what do you think he was feeling about Randolph's proposed march? I mean, was he worried, what, what was his worry if the march did happen? His worry, his worry was that, that, that the other groups would uh, perhaps uh, interfere, they'd be uh, bickering along the parade line and so forth on. That's what he was afraid of. He was afraid other groups would uh, uh, insurrect against the, their march. That's what he was afraid of. Mm -hmm. yeah. What was his attitude about the way black people were, were demanding their rights? Did, did he feel that was going too far? No. Did the president did? No, he, he never expressed himself that way. Uh, uh, Mrs. Roosevelt kept that, uh, that side of it. Uh, and the, uh, uh, she would... Uh, she, uh, the President Roosevelt, he had many angles. What I mean by that, every member of his family were political industry, and perhaps sometimes in, the, in their own favor, but they was interested in, in getting the information to him. Uh, he, they, they couldn't shut the President Roosevelt out, even his valet. Uh, McDuffie, he went around and intermingled with the blacks, and he took a forefront with the blacks, and the blacks felt they could talk through, uh, to the President, through uh, through uh, through McDuffie, uh, and uh, he he had many sources, and, and of course uh, he he uh, he knew what was he knew what was going on, yeah, and of course everybody thought that all the minorities and, uh, and masses of people felt if they told Mrs. Roosevelt there's no question about it he'd get back to the president. And of course, the, the pre she was a great force for the president. She she really kept some of these people perhaps in in abeyance because she was out there with them. See, and they were sure. Right. They were sure. Now another very dramatic moment when you were in the White House was when Pearl Harbor, Harbor was bombed. Yes. Can you describe that day for me? Tell me where you were and what you saw, and especially how President Roosevelt reacted. Well, that day. Uh, uh, well, I'll just tell you about that day. I, I, I'm about to add to my, I was about to go back and tell you about the, the, the week before. But you want the day just about, that day. just that day of Pearl Harbor. <laughs> you know what, Jerry? Yeah. I think I'll change. Okay, let's stop. <laughs> okay, so just that day now. Tell me the story. Well, we were having a luncheon, 40 ladies in the state dining room. And the president was having uh, Mr. Hopkins and Mr. Bullitt, the former ambassador to Russia, and uh, General Watson, uh, Watson and Miss Tully. And I had assigned two men to serve the luncheon, and I would uh, go from one to the other. It's like a three-ring circus sometimes at the White House. So I would go upstairs and see how they were progressing, come back downstairs to the dining room. And uh, my pantry crew, uh, detail, lined them up. And as I re uh, had just left the president, 
the information hadn't arrived up there to him then. As I came downstairs, uh, I was looking over the dining room, and I saw they were ready for the, uh, to change the course for the solid course. And I went in and got my crew working. And uh, when I went upstairs, there, uh, my men were standing around. They didn't know what to do. The president was, oh, he was in a heel. He had his head in his hand. And he was saying, oh, my God, my God, how did it happen? How did it happen? Now I go down, I'll go down in disgrace in history. And he was just shaking his head like that. The um, General Watson and, oh, yes, Mr. McIntyre had come up, Secretary McIntyre. They were carrying messages. And Mrs. Uh, Tully, Miss Tully was getting communication from uh, Naval Operation Admiral Sharp. And she was bring, they were bringing messages back and then forth. And finally, Watson came out. He says, uh, Mr. President, they got the whole goddamn Navy. Navy. What in the hell are we going to do now? And the president just sat there amazed. He says, how did it happen? How did it happen? Uh, Mr. Hopkins spoke up and he says, well, we can't decide what's, what this will mean until later on. We, and then the president says, where is Marshall? Well, Marshall's, uh, we're trying to find Marshall. And he says, uh, 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 Leahy and, 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 and Admiral King are on the way here. They'll be here in, in a minute. By that time, they were there. Can I just ask you to repeat that one piece where he was told that they got the whole fleet? Who was it who told him? General that? Marshall. Uh, not the General him. Marshall. General Watson. Okay. And Gen what, just tell me that part of the story one yeah. more time. Uh, he said uh, he came out with the, uh, with the uh, uh, information in his hand. My God, my God, Mr. President, look like they got the whole goddamn Navy. What in the hell are we going to do now? And the president says, uh, we're... He just sat there in amaze and kind of shaking his head, shaking his head. And then finally he looked up. He says, uh, Where is, have you gotten Marshall? Is Marshall coming? Yeah, and they said, we're trying to find Marshall. But Admiral Leahy and King will be here any minute. And by that time, they stepped into the, to the study. Such and then, a dramatic day. Yeah. What a dramatic moment. Yeah. And then what happened next? Time? Then, then from then on, well, of course, the whole place was buzzing. And uh, the usher's office, uh, the doorman was bringing in chairs, and the president was at his desk, and he formed a horseshoe. Uh, all the different congressmen and, and, and military men and, and advisors. And uh, from then on, uh, we, the luncheon was canceled. I set up for beer and sandwiches, and we were serving from then until 1.30 one, one in, in, the, in the next morning. And the last, after I dismissed my men, well, of course, then the war issue had brought up. Uh, uh, Secret Service had to have a clear on everyone, a clearance on everyone. And uh, I'm making out my list to give the Secret Service. And, and uh, uh, the, I went, uh, before I left, Mr. Clarence, the Usher on duty, he came to me and says, the president wants uh, two beers and sandwiches up in, in his office. Says to send them up right away. But I had no one to send. So I took it up myself. And when I got up there, Mr. Ed Moore was talking to him. It seemed like Ed Moore had been sitting around all the afternoon for his appointment. And at that hour, the president was talking to Ed. Uh, and uh, uh, there seemed to be a maze, a blue maze around him. He seemed that tired. And, and uh, uh, he said to, he says, well, Ed, I don't know what's out there, but I will declare war on, on uh, Japan tomorrow. I will not declare war on Germany yet, but I will declare war on Japan. He says, we don't know what's out there. We won't know until to, to we clear it up tomorrow. Right. And of course, I left him and he was... And I, as I left, went home that night, I said to myself, my God, uh, I, I knew that I was so tired that uh, sleep would embrace me when I go home, but I wondered what the what president would, would. What would the president do? Yeah. You, you, you see these people, and, 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 you, and, and you, you, you do take on, and, and you realize, after all, it's your country. I don't care what, what you may say about whatever, what other country do you have at that time. Yeah. It's your country, yeah. and you feel for them. You feel for the... And you were there at all oh, those I, moments. I, I was there. Yeah. I was there. I saw it. 
I saw the expressions on their face. I heard their, their, their bad language and so forth. And <laughs> what I thought about Sometimes. these. But yeah. you knew what they were struggling yes. with. Yes. Well, that was great. Did yeah. You got to the end. Um, of declaring war. Yeah. But not the uh, Cold War. No, 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 that's fine. That's great.